bless the Lord Jesus. I greet you in the exalted name of Jesus Christ, our great God, the God of heaven and earth. You know, there's none like him. I've always said that there's none to be compared to him. The scripture says, from the rising of the sun, even to the going down of the very same, his name is to be praised. One of my favorite verses in scripture, because it declares that from the morning to the evening, we should praise and worship our great God, the God of heaven and of earth. Amen. Um, tonight, I am happy to be in another Bible study session with you and to be delivering the word of God. Amen. To you tonight. You know, Pastor Daly have been doing a session, or doing a topic for the past few weeks, uh, walking in the word. Praise God. But tonight again, like I did a few weeks ago, I mean, the last time I was here, I did the topic, you can understand the word. And tonight we're taking another perspective as it relates to the word of God. Because we want to walk in the word of God, but one of the things that the enemy comes with is that he wants you to doubt the word of God. So tonight, I'm here to talk on the topic, you can believe the word. And as we go into this tonight, I'm going to show you some reasons, I'll give you some good reasons why we can believe and hold fast to the word of God that we have it today. Praise God. Now, the Bible declares to us in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16 that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And the Bible said, it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. And it says that the man of God may be competent, according to the NIV, and equipped for every good work. You know, because that is how powerful and how effective the word of God is in our lives. That is one of the reasons that our bishop take the time out to put across this topic to us that we must walk in the word because the word of God is for instruction. It's profitable for reproof, it's for correction, it's for instruction in righteousness so that at the end of the day, the man of God might be fully equipped, amen, be at a place in God, he might be mature in God and we get all of that through the word of God. But we notice, amen, and I'm looking at moving to the slides that I have on the, uh, the slides that I have, Praise God. You can notice from the word of God that the devil has always tried in some form or the other, tried to distort the word. And when we look into the Bible and we look in the scripture in Matthew chapter 4 verse 1 to 11, we see where Jesus met the devil. You know, he was about to start his ministry. He was about to start his work. Amen. And he met the devil in the wilderness. And the only resource he had, the only resource the devil had, or the only resource that Jesus had at that particular time to combat the enemy was the word of God. Amen. So as we realize, uh, the word of God is that weapon, amen, that Satan is afraid of. Praise God. And if you look in Matthew chapter 4, the scripture we just talked about a while ago, we realize that the devil attempted to take on Jesus in three different areas of his life. Praise God. He asked him firstly to, con what, to turn stone into bread. Amen. That he wanted to relieve his hunger. He asked him to jump off the pinnacle uh, of a high mountain to the point where angels would catch him if or break his fall. We asked him to, at the end, to kneel before him. Amen. In return that he would give him all the kingdoms of the world. But notice Jesus' reply to the devil. It is written, he said, one should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Amen. And he quoted from Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 3. When the devil said he must cast himself after a mountain, amen, and the, the angel will break your fall. He quoted again from Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 16. He said again, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Amen. And that's according to the NIV. And then when he tried to to tell him that he must bow down before him and he must worship him. Amen. Jesus again quoted from Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 13 and Deuteronomy chapter 10 and verse 20. He said, get thee behind me, Satan. Amen. You must worship the Lord your God and him alone you must serve. So Jesus was able to use the word of God for that is the weapon, brothers and sisters, that the devil is afraid of. He fears the man or, or the woman who hides themselves in the word, who somebody who hides the word of God in their heart. He fears it 
Because the word of God is your weapon. It's a weapon that you can put against the enemy. And if you realize, brothers and sisters, in the Garden of Eden, the devil had won him. He had won him as he attacked Eve. And I call it an attack because his aim was to ensure that he get her to fall. And he didn't want to get the victory. But one thing would have afforded him the victory. And that is to get Eve to be at a place where she doubts the word of God. Or she distorts the word of God. And that's why it's important. These two things are important. One, distorting the word of God comes with interpretation. How you interpret the word of God. You can take any scripture and make any doctrine. So the devil wants you to distort the word of God. And we went through some basic principles in our last time. As it relates to how to understand the word. Amen. But apart from the fact that he wants you to distort the word. He wants you to doubt the word. Amen. And tonight I'm going to show you from the word of God. That we don't need to doubt this book that God has given to us. It is full. Amen. It is full of, 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 of what we need to live. It is full of what we need to live. And it proves over and over and over that the word of God is true. The scripture says, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is true. St. John 17, 17. Now, before the 1800s, as you can see on your slide, many persons believed in the word of God. It was a time where, where, where if you realize, especially in the old time, in the 1800s, especially like in the Americans, when you have people like the Puritans and these men, America was established upon the very word of God. And across the world, in many places, persons hold on to the Bible. Um, the countries that were considered to be Christian countries held on to the word of God. The word of God was believed without doubt. They held it high. However, in the 1800s, after that, there came what is called the higher critical attack. Amen. That began to rise against the word of God. There was a French guy, a French philosopher, who said that he came across with the suggestion that Jesus was just a mystical character. And when you hear people start saying, boy, if Jesus exists, or you have any proof that Jesus exists, and, they had, and, and, and Christian apologists had to come up with things from history to prove the fact that Jesus exists. It's based on all of these things that came about from the 1800s, starting with the French philosopher who declared and brought it to the minds of people, tried to put doubts in their mind that Jesus actually exists. And the same thing applies to the day. As I said before, the devil's aim is to get you to either doubt the word of God or he wants you to distort the word of God. But let us look at some, what some critics have said over the, the time to show you what the devil is trying to inject in the minds of people. There was a French writer by the name of, that is known as Voltaire. And he lived between, 19, between 1694 and 1778. And hear what this guy said. He said, another century, and there will be no Bible on the earth. In other words, like other books that have perished over time. Amen. The Bible was popular in that century. And he was saying that you can go and think about this. Let's give it one more century, and we're going to have no more Bible on earth. I'm happy that God preserves his word. I am happy that God is true to his word. His word is true to every generation. He's going to ensure that in every generation, there is somebody, there is a word. But the good thing about this too, is that, brothers and sisters, to this very date, the, if you do a research, the Bible is the most popular book in print. If you're going to look at just the NIV version alone, every year, over 100,000 NIV Bibles are are, are sold. And we're talking about one version because not every organization uses the NIV. So you're talking about the KJV or the REB or whatever other versions that exist out there. And all of these have been sold. The NIV from its inception have printed, have printed over 9 million copies. That's a whole heap. And that's just one translation. So I'm happy to say to Mr. Voltaire that you are incorrect, sir. Praise God. The word of God is going to stand the test of time. There was another guy, Bruno Barr, a professor of the university in Bonn, in Germany. And he lived between 1809 and 1882. And he said, Jesus of Nazareth was not the son of God. 
And he said he never existed. I am happy again to say that, sir, you are wrong. Because history proves it, that Jesus exists. You have men, amen, who have written history about the man Jesus. Josephus was one of the many famous Jewish historians. He was not a Christian. He had no reason to write about Jesus of Nazareth. He had no reason to write this, but he was a historian. He was not a Christian. And guess what? He was a historian during the time where he could write the fact that Jesus of Nazareth existed. If you check the complete writings of Josephus, he will tell you about Jewish history. And I'm happy that he didn't leave out the fact that there was a man that was born in Nazareth that people looked at who worked miracles. And if you can write it, in, he wrote it in his writings. The man was not a Christian, as I said before. But he proved this man wrong based on history that there was a man called Jesus that existed. And he died and he buried and he was rose again the third day. Let us move to the other one. Because it's about five different uh, persons that have come on the scene who have tried to debunk this thing. But we can believe the word of God. Thomas Spain, 1737 to 1809, said, The Bible is such a book of lies and contradictions. There is no knowing which part to believe. Well, my brother, I guess the person with the unlearned mind would say that. The Bible de clearly declare that the natural man understands not the things of the spirit because they are spiritually discerned to him. To him it is foolishness. But I'm happy that when I read the word of God, the word of God, because there is a God in heaven and this is his word, it brings clarity to my mind when I read the word. I see that there is no contradictions in scriptures. And what are seemingly contradictions mean that you probably have not interpreted it correctly. Because the word of God is true. It is true. Samuel Longhorn Clement, better known by his pen name, Mark Twain. And you have heard of Mark Twain before. 1835 to 1910. Said the Bible is a mass of fables and traditions, mere mythology. Huh. I will prove to you tonight that this word of God is not a mass of fables and traditions. But everything that they thought was true, amen, the, and the word of God had a contradicting matter. At the end of the day, the word of God, which contradicted their thing, came out to be true. Because the word of God is absolute truth. So sorry, Mr. Mark Twain. What you have is a bunch of mass and fables and traditions and mere mythology. But the word of God stands the test of time. And it is forever true and forever will be settled in heaven. The Bible says heaven and earth will pass away before one of his word <laughs> should not come to pass. This word of God is true. And that is why Bishop is telling us to walk in this word. Because you can't go wrong. You can't miss the mark. And to sin in the Hebrew actually means to miss the mark. You can't miss the mark when you walk. In the word of God. So let us try to ensure that we believe the word of God. Look at the fifth one. And this is probably somebody brings closer to home. This guy named Christopher Hitchens, 1949. He died in 2011. I know the slide says to present, but he actually died in 2011. Uh, he said, and here is he trying to make a mockery of the scriptures. I hope, I'm sure... Not even I hope. I am sure that he's not making a mockery now. But he said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that those who believe in him will believe in anything. In other words, he's making a mockery of the word of God to say that if you believe in Jesus, then obviously it's a similar thing. You can believe in Santa Claus, and you can believe in goblins, and you can believe in Doppy. And de well, demons exist. But you can believe in all the mythical the, the figures that exist out there. And he's saying, for God so loved the world. But brothers and sisters, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him shall not perish. That's the word. But have everlasting life. Christopher, you missed it. And I'm sure right now you'll reject, you, 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 you regret the fact that you made those comments. Because at the end of the day, the word of God is true. Amen. And it shall not return unto him void, but shall accomplish that which he set forth to do. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, 
that whosoever believeth in him will not perish. That's the word. But have everlasting life. Praise God. I love the word of God. I love the word of God. I love the word of God. So tonight, so tonight, praise God, I join with the Apostle Paul as he made a very important point to the church in Rome. And I want to tonight say those same words to us as we look into believing what this Bible says. Paul says, for what if some did not believe? And he asks that question. In other words, not everybody going to believe. But so what? For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? And, 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 and even though it's, it was a type of question where he did not necessarily give the answer per se, we can answer it. No! It don't make the word of God or the faith of God without effect. He said, God forbid. He said, yeah, let God be true. But every man a liar. I rather to hold on to what the word of God says to my grave than to believe anything else. No matter how it looks. No matter how if everybody believes it. No matter if society on a whole holds on to it. Because what we're going to realize is that there were many things that society held on to. That the word of God said it was different. Men like Clement and these men. Ask Gustine and these men who used to believe some things. People used to say they were talking foolishness. And even though they were not apostolic men. There were some things that they held on to. That the word of God says that was contradicting to what society was saying. But I'm saying to you, let God be true. Let God be true. And every man a liar. Because guess what happened? The word of God. You can believe the word of God. Now, next slide. There are many evidence from the word of God that proves that the word of God, as we have today, is true. I don't believe that God left, left us or left us without a witness. And, and, and we don't have to feel intimidated by anyone or nobody when you say you believe the Bible. I remember when I was in college and I was in a particular class and I did a particular course that was called Discrete Mathematics. And if you know Discrete Mathematics, it's a little different than the normal mathematics in the sense that it appeals to logics and reasoning. And there was a particular lecturer who actually did not believe in God. And he tried to prove based on logics and reasoning that God did not exist. And people, the man sound like he was making sense. But that's how the devil is. He talk foolishness. And sometimes it sounds like it makes sense. You have to be careful. Try the spirit. But I strongly believe that our all-powerful God at the same time did not leave us without a witness. As the slide says, our all-powerful supreme God of infinite intelligence carefully provided more than sufficient evidence to remove any doubt that exists. And I believe that God did that. This is not the Quran. This is not the Bhagavad Gita. These are not these religious other books that exist. This is the word of God. And when God came with the word, what he did, he ensured that he placed at different points in the word stuff that would have baffled the minds even of people in that time. And when we come to prove it, they say, whoa, how is it that these men knew these things so long ago? They didn't know it. But God knew it. To say that this person knew this thing. No, no, no. It was a case where they, they didn't know it per se. But we serve a God who existed in the past, the present, and the future. He put those things there. So that men who believed the word from back there held on by faith. I said, Bible says, he that cometh to God must believe that he is. And that is a reward to them that diligently seek him. Praise God. 
Tonight, we are going to look at five areas in science where men had it wrong from centuries. For many years, men had it wrong. And they thought they had it right. But the word of God had it right all along. All this time where men thought that they were doing things that, 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 that they said. And, and people have this thing now to say that you have relative truth. But I don't believe in that. There's only one truth I know about and it's absolute truth. If it was true yesterday, it's going to be true tomorrow. And if it was going to be true tomorrow, it's going to be true the other day. Amen. I was born a black man. And if you in the other side of the world think I was white, your thinking of me being white does not change the fact that I am black. In other words, the truth is I am black. That's absolute truth. And it's universal. And it's narrow. And it don't take any other option. It's just truth. So when men believe all kind of things over the centuries, the word of God, the absolute truth of God had it right all along. When we realize that the scientific accuracy of the Bible, I strongly believe tonight that at the end of this session, our faith should be lifted. Because the Bible says in Proverbs 30 verse 5 that every word of God proves true. And this is according to, not the, the KJV, it's according to the, uh, I think it was the revised standard division, I think it was. But every word of God proves true. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Every word of God, we're going to prove it to be true. And guess what happened? When you prove and you hold on to the word of God, he is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Look at, these are the five areas that we'll be looking at tonight. One, we're looking at biology. And for just because I don't want to use a term and not define it, I want to ensure that we are all on the same page. Let me define what some of these things are in basic definition. So biology is the study of living organisms. We're going to look at astronomy, not astrology. There's a difference, right? So we're looking at astronomy, which is the study of celestial objects and space. We're going to look at geology which is a study of Earth's physical structure and substances. We're going to look at meteorology, the study of atmospheric changes that define climates over time. We're going to look at physics, which is a science that deals with matter and energy and their interaction. So in these five areas, we're going to realize that men had concepts in these for years that they thought was true. But they had it wrong. But guess what? The Bible had it true all along. Let us jump firstly into biology. Brothers and sisters, at one time, people considered blood to be the carrier of disease. And they drew blood for health reasons. Let me explain what is happening here. What usually happened back in a long, long time ago, Probably in the time of Moses and, and by other nations. During that time, many, many ages ago, when men were sick, and I think even quite up to in the 1800s or the 1700s, when man was sick, they were saying that the disease that you have was carried by the blood. So what they usually do is drain your blood. You know what people died because of what they did? They drained the blood. Because they are saying that the blood was the carrier of disease. And therefore, in order to purge you from the particular disease, what they would have done is to draw the blood. But Jesus had a concept. The word of God taught us something many, many years ago. Even from the time of Moses. Let's just look at the scripture in Leviticus. Leviticus chapter 17 and verse 11. It says, for the life of the flesh... Is in the blood. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that make it an atonement for the soul. From the time of Leviticus, and if you could even noting about the writing of Leviticus, it was written during the time for, for about three month period of time when they were around Sinai. So when the children of Israel left Egypt 
and they reached the Sinai region. They spent about three months in the Sinai region. And it was this time when God, Moses went up into the mountain to get the command from God. And when he got the command from God, he wrote the book of Leviticus, which are practically laws that would have governed how the priest should operate. It was mainly given to how the priest should dress, or the priest should operate, how he should live, how you must do your sacrifices, so on and so forth, for three months. Very short period of time. And during that time, Moses was living in a time where men believed that disease was in the blood. But God knew different. And God said to Moses, who wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, that the life of the flesh, hallelujah, is in the blood. Think about it, brothers and sisters. When somebody goes to a hospital today, what are the first thing they say to you? Can you come and give blood for him or she? And they ensure at the end of the day that they have a blood bank. You know what's that blood bank now? Blood bank is something that they try to use to preserve your life. So when they realize that when you come into the hospital and you're under some serious sickness, they try to give you blood. Because the life of the flesh is in the blood. Life, brothers and sisters, depends depends on blood it is preserved by blood and it is nourished by blood and guess what biologists just have learned that <laughs> boy may i tell you i love the word of god but god had it right a long time ago from leviticus time when enough blood leaves a body guess what happened life leaves the body so when they were draining the blood, they were taking your life. But Jesus knew that. The word of God had that. Moses wrote that. And that was established. You can't believe the word. Because even in biology, we see where it is right from the inception. Let us look at another thing in biology. Before 1775, it was believed there were five distinct races. With each having a different blood. Can you believe that? Now you understand what pushed people like Hitler. Was it Hitler? No. What was the name of this guy who, who actually tried to get rid of the Israeli nation? Uh, Hitler. Hitler. And he believed that he had a superior nation. He believed that his set of people were the pure people and everybody else had, was a different, distinct race. So before 1775, it was believed that there were five distinct races. And every one of these races had different blood. But guess what happened now? The Bible tells us different from a long time. In Acts chapter 17, verse 26. And if you can remember, Acts chapter 17, it was where Paul dealt with the philosophers at Mars Hill. If you remember Acts chapter 17 is where Paul went to Athens to talk to men. And Paul made a profound statement when he spoke to these men. He said, ha, God made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth. And had determined the times before appointed and the bones of their, in, of their habitation. But note the part that I highlighted. And hath made of one blood all nations of men. For to dwell on all the face of the earth. I believe Paul said that to the people in Athens. To the philosophers. To the men who believe Greek mythology and Greek philosophy. He held to something, the great inspiration from God. That we didn't have five distinct blood types. So guess what happened now? What Paul said in the first century. A scientist in the 1900s. A guy by the name by Carl Landsteiner discovered that all human blood has one common base, namely plasma. My God. I could have stopped here in Bible study tonight. Because we just look at biology alone. And we are seeing already that the word of God had it true from morning. But let's go one more biology fact. In Leviticus and Deuteronomy, and I just put the scriptures here. It told us 
how we should deal with sanitation and health. It tell you how you must deal with wash before you do this. And you must cleanse yourself before you do this. And you ensure that you set up this and that and you don't mix this and that. And God told the priest how to do this. And I strongly believe if God didn't tell the priest how to do this, then trust me, all of Israel would have been dead today. Think about the amount of disease that comes by handling corpse and dead bodies. And this is what the priest did every day. And on the Sabbath, they did it double. <laughs> and while other persons didn't understand the sanitation, God gave Moses the sanitation and the health things. How he must deal with health from way in the book of Leviticus. What a God. He did this because they were he tell them how to deal with eating pork, anything of unclean animals, of creeping things, eating of blood. He tell them, say, look here, don't deal with certain things because of the type of disease that comes with it. He tell them there's a regulation of treating of infectious diseases such as leprosy. You separate yourself from the those that have leprosy. Because trust me, a lot of people died and God gave them that law before there was even left. He said, okay, if a man get this particular disease, let him show himself to the priest. And from him finding out his leper, let him separate himself from the people. And if, if, as a matter of fact, it was so contagious, a man that had leprosy, that if he saw another man walking within a certain direction, he had to shout, unclean. And it all depends on the blowing of the wind. Because if the wind was blowing in a particular direction, he had to ensure that he was much further away. Because the, the very disease is so God powerful. He knew that the disease could be airborne. It could be transferred through the air by passing from the skin. The pus and the disease that transferred from the person. The wind would have carried it. And God does God deal with all of that in the word. All these regulations were a part of his ceremonial laws. And, they, and, and guess what happened now? The same ceremonial values... And things that God put in place in ancient Israel. Where there was no light and there was no internet and there was no computers. And there was no nothing to test this and test that. Guess what? It's the same set of people they are using in science today. Where you take them say wash your hand? Ensure you wash your hand, eh? COVID-19. And they tell you that this thing kill that. And wear a mask. And do this and do that. You think them laws that just come in place is something that the word of God knew a long time ago. And tell Israel, if Israel never knew this, as I said before, they would have died in the wilderness. Because it was a certain nation that dealt with a lot of animals. Can you imagine how much sacrifices they brought before God every day? But yet still not one of them we were here died in a particular way like that. Because God put laws in place. To deal with that. That's just biology. Let us move to uh, astrology. Astronomy. Forgive me. Astronomy. Now during the Middle Ages, it was believed that the earth is flat. And even up to Time like men like Christopher Columbus. It was still believed that the earth is flat. You know one of the reasons why most of these men never ventured out far? Because when they looked out on the sea and they saw the horizon, they believed that if they sail out too far, they're going to reach a point where they're going to drop off the earth. Christopher Columbus took a risk by going out. And that's why I'm talking about the new earth, the new it was no new world. It was the same world. But I mean, we, we, we understand what he was saying because it was discovered in our sense because he never knew it existed. But the reason why they believe this is because of their concept of the world. They believe that the earth was flat. Now somebody might say, boy, that was the truth of the day. The truth? It was never the truth. And that's why I tell you I don't believe in relative truth. I believe it absolute truth because even when the men believed that the earth was flat and they didn't have the equipment to show that the earth was not flat, the earth was not flat. And at the end of the day, even what you believe, and we'll come to that later on, even what you believe, 
If the word of God says this is it, you can hold on to the word of God. Now, look at what the Bible says. Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 22. It says, it is he, talking about God, that sitteth upon the circles of the earth. My God. Now you're talking about Isaiah, which was hundreds of years before Christ came on the scene. Now I said before, Christopher Columbus believed that the earth is flat in his time. So you can imagine Isaiah. In Isaiah time was way, way, way before Jesus came, which would have been way, way, way before Christopher Columbus came. And it was a time where the majority of where many people, better yet, it was a time where all of society held to the flat earth belief. Nowadays, some, you have some crazy group going about calling them fat, like flat earth society group. Trying to hold back to these old things, you know? Trying to deny what science already proved that the earth is not flat. But it was believed by that. But Isaiah penned these words in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 22. That it was he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth. And the inhabitation thereof are as grass of her that stretcheth out the heavens as a curtain and spread them out as a tent to dwell in. Praise God. Now, I have a question to ask. How could Isaiah possibly know that the earth's shape was a circle? Or better yet, that the earth was not flat? And I answer it. He probably didn't know. I strongly believe that he probably didn't know. But guess what? The Lord, the God of heaven... Jesus, Jehovah, who spoke all things into being, who said, let there be, and there was. The Lord who spoke through Isaiah knew. And because God don't want us to get false things, he wrote to Isaiah and said, it is he, God, hallelujah, that sits upon the circles of the earth. The Hebrew word for circle is the word K-H-U-G, Kog, which may be translated to refer to the circle of the horizon or speak to a spherical shape thing. So what I'm saying is he that sitteth upon the circle, talking about the circle of the horizon. When you look at the earth from outside, you see the horizon and God sits on it. What a mighty God. What a powerful God. What an awesome God. But not only that, there's another belief in astronomy. In ancient time. It is said that the earth was held up by, by the backs of elephants or giant turtles. So in many other religions, Hinduism and all of these other isms that exist out there. It was a belief that the earth is flat. But not only that is flat, that is on the back. So it sounds stupid today. But that's what they held on to. It was on the back of giant elephants and giant turtles. My God. But look what the Bible said in the book of Job. The Bible said, He, talking about God, and this is Job 26, verse 7, He stretched out the north over the empty place. And hang it the earth upon nothing. Nowadays, when we look at satellites showing imagery of the earth, we realize that it's just out there in outer space. There is something that is, it hangs on nothing. And guess what? Job knew that. You know what is fascinating about Job, even more than Isaiah? It is said that Job is one of the first books that were written. A lot of us probably don't know that. But most, or many theologians hold to the fact that Job was one of the first books that was written. 
Now, if Job is one of the first book that was written, it means it predates Moses. And if during that time, Job wrote under the inspiration of God that God hung the earth and nothing, and we have it in the word, who am I to, not, to doubt this Bible? Because guess what happened? Society had it wrong all along. But God had it right all this time. I ask the question again. How could Job possibly know the earth hangs on nothing? And I give the answer, he probably didn't know. Just like Isaiah. But again, the Lord, our God, the creator of the heavens of the earth, the one who says, let there be, and there was, the mighty God, Jehovah, spoke through Job. And guess what? He knew. Because he's the one who created it. I love God. There's another thing in astronomy that puzzles my mind. There's a great philosopher, great scientist, Ptolemy. And he counted 1,056 stars, claiming at his time that the number of stars could not exceed 3,000. And whatever equipment he used in 150 AD, he said that there's, he only counted at least 1,056. I don't know where he was counting. I'm not sure what he was doing. But I guess Sim said, look here, all right, then I reached 1,056 in my counting. You know what? I'm tired. But I don't think it would never exist. It would exceed, sorry, 3,000. But look what God said to Jeremiah. God made a statement to Jeremiah. He said, thus said the Lord, if heaven above can be measured, and the foundations of the earth search out beneath. So while the heavens is massive, equally beneath the earth is massive. That's what he's saying. I watch a movie the other day where they're trying to go to the core of the earth. God bless them with that. Because I don't think they'll ever do that. They're using equipment to try to get to the core of the earth and they can't. So I'm saying if you can measure the heavens above and the foundation of the earth search out then guess what at that point in time i will cast off all the seed of israel for all that they have done so god was speaking to jeremiah i said any day name day man is able to measure the heavens or to search out the earth beneath and at that point in time I went cast off the seed of Israel. That's how we know that God is not done with Israel. The Bible always says blindness in part is to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. God don't cast them out. I cast them off. And God was giving this word to Jeremiah, who was a prophet, who prophesied during the time. He's what is both a, we call a pre-exilic prophet and an exilic prophet. Mean he prophesied before the Babylonian captivity and he also existed during the Babylonian captivity. And he sent a word to them to say, look here. Any day you can measure the foundation of the earth. And search out the earth, the heavens and the earth. Then I will cast off Israel. But he also made another statement in Jeremiah chapter 33 and verse 22. He said, as the host of the heavens cannot be numbered. Sorry, Polymy. Your 3,000 number is very off. He said, as the host of the heaven cannot be numbered, neither the sands of the sea measured, so will I multiply the seed of David, my servant, and the Levites that ministered unto me. In other words, God was making this point, even in this statement, that the host of heavens, the stars and the planets and the galaxies, you know, and the more we look out, is the more we see more and more and more and more and more. At one point in time, they looked and they see our well, we, oh, little galaxy, the Milky Way. And today, people have to say that the Milky Way is like a baby fraction. It's like 0. 0.0000, little bit percent in comparison to the entire universe. 
And when we look about the amount of stars that exist in our galaxy alone, we can't even number it. And our galaxy is one of the small galaxies according to what they are seeing. The Bible had it right all along. No, the Bible had it all right all along, as I said before. The stars cannot be numbered. Ptolemy said there was only 3,000, but today they have counted over 500 billion plus and counted. And that was the age of some of them huge telescopes that they have today, and this radio telescopes that they have. And they're still counting. And they reach 500 billion plus more. They're counting, 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 counting. Every now and then they try to find a planet like Earth. And they call them, they, they're trying to find planets that form within, within, a, pertin, within, a, within a particular spot. They call it the, I forgot, I forgot the term, it's something zone. I forgot the term that they use, but it, it has to meet certain criteria. And they're looking out there and every now and then they say, the boy, they see a star, they see a new one. And they see a new one. And they look further around and they see a new one. And you know what the problem is? They can't even reach there. So even the telescope, pick it up. Not one of us can reach there. It's going to take billions of years. As a matter of fact, if we should travel from through our little Milky Way, from Earth to reach the end point of our Milky Way, none of us we can make it. We can't make it. We don't have so much life. It will take thousands of years just to reach just the end of our galaxy. And they are saying that they are seeing beyond that point in time. So while Ptolemy only saw 1,000 and something, and he went on to say there's going to only be 3,000, the word of God tell us long time. My God. That look here. You can't number the stars. I think it was Abraham who said, look up into the heavens and number the stars. And look up on the shore and number the seashore. Because he was trying to make to Abraham to look at man. That's how much a seed is going to be. I know that Abraham could not have numbered the stars. You can't number them. And while I'm saying all of this, I go back to the point, the subject tonight. You can't believe the word of God. You can't believe the word of God. Let us jump to geology. Which is the third one. Now, in Genesis chapter 1 verse 2, the Bible shows us that water was everywhere. Actually, they can just look at that scripture quickly and tell you what it says. It says, and the, the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of the Lord moved upon the face of the waters. So it shows that there was, the earth was practically underwater. Genesis chapter 1 verse 9 says, And God said, Let the waters under the heavens be gathered together unto one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. So God called out the dry land out of the water. In Genesis chapter 7 verse 20, God did something again. During the flood, God said that, all the mountains, all the high hills were covered with water. Up to about 15 cubits, which is about 22 feet deep and upwards. And Psalms 104 verse 69, it suggests that water stood above the mountains. Now, to show that the word of God is so true, geology probably didn't understand this. But I, I believe that God put these things in place that we, at the end of the day, can trust and believe what the word of God says. Because guess what happened now? In 1885, a guy by the name of Edward Seuss was one of the first geologists to show that all land masses have once been underwater. And consistently, we are finding sea fossils and guess where I find the sea fossils? Not in the sea. They are finding sea fossils on mountain tops. Now, why, where, why would sea fossils be on mountain tops? It indicates that the mountains were once underwater. So, when the Bible said in Genesis that there was a great flood, 
and it covered the mountains up to about 15 cubits or 22 feet. It brought with it because everything was covered for about 40 days and 40 nights. It showed the fact that fishes were there, fossils, sea fossils were there, and it brought it to the mountain tops. So the tallest mountains are in Jamaica, mountain like Blue Mountain Peak was covered with water. And scientists are discovering sea fossils on these mountain tops. Geology proved that the word of God. And I go back to the point again that I started with earlier. I go back to the point that I started with earlier before I jump into the next two points. The Bible says in Romans chapter 3 and verse 3 to 4, for what if some did not believe? So like a question. So, you have a lot of scientists out there who are trying to tell people that God don't exist and what the word of God says is foolishness and all of this and all of that. And Paul asked the church in Roman, the Roman church, the church in Rome, for what if some of them don't believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? In other words, because they don't believe it, it makes the word of God not true? Mm -mm. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing the word of God. So Paul put it nicely. He said, look here, God forbid. And I'm saying that to somebody tonight. God forbid. But let God be true. I wonder if somebody can hold on to that, this word, this, this morning. I don't know what your situation is, you know. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know how much problems you're having. But if God says, I'm going to fight for you. God, I'm going to fight for you. Let God be true. If God said, look, man, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lead out to your own understanding, always acknowledging, man, he will direct your path. If God said he's going to direct your path, let God be true. If God said he's able to sustain you in the wilderness, I tell you all the time, when I flew over that desert, and I saw what the children of Israel had to walk through, I saw the example of what a desert looked like. If God says he's going to prepare a table for you in the presence of your enemy in the midst of a desert, let God be true. If God says, look, at the end of the day, I'm going to bring you out. If God tell you today, say, I'm going to make you the president of IBM. And you don't have no computer skills. And God will teach you everything we need to teach you. Let God be true. And at the end of the day, let every man be a liar. Because over and over, we have seen it so far. We have seen it so far in biology, where God was true and man was wrong. We have seen it in astronomy, where God was true and man was wrong. We see it in geology, where man was, where God was true and man was wrong. Let God be true. You can believe the word of God. And we have two more areas to go, so we can jump back. To the slides let us look at meteorology and while I wait for it to come up you're going to see on your screen something that most of us most of us learned in school I learned this from primary school days anybody know this it's called the water cycle and what it practically says is that as the word suggests, water moves in a cycle. So, when we have water on the land, we have what is called the sun, cause what is called evaporation. And when it goes up into the clouds, after a while the clouds get heavy, full of water. And whatever causes it, there's a next thing that is called condensation. So condensation, when it goes up into the cloud, and when it gets heavy, then it starts to let out the water, which is precipitation. And it comes back to the earth and it's collected. So you have water that is on the earth, and we can see you have water that's under the earth. It's collected. 
And guess what? The cycle goes again. Because the sun shines on the earth. And then there's what happens again. There's evaporation. And it goes in a cycle. Now, in 1580, there's a guy by the name of Bernard Palissy. And he claimed... And I say claim because the truth is the Bible teaches this thing a long time ago. He claimed that he has discovered the modern theory of the water cycle. He discovered the modern theory of the water cycle. He looked at the hydraulic cycle and he said, boy, this is how it works. This is from 1580. But look what happened now. I believe that he was not the original. <laughs> because God gave it to Job years ago. Look at Job chapter 36, verse 27 to 28. He says he draws up the drops of the water, which distill as rain to the stream. The clouds pour down their moisture, and abundant showers fall on mankind. The man brings out the whole water cycle in the book of Job. And you know what I like about God? I think God did these things to make we realize that he is God, you know. And that we might get an understanding that we don't need to doubt him. He never read until he give it to Paul. He never give it to Paul because like he could have given this knowledge to Paul. He could have given it to Peter in the New Testament. It would have been effective. But the man went way to the beginning of time. Job, when man had no idea of science. Per se, that type of science. As a matter of fact, the only economy, the only society, sorry, that was very good on science in, back in that days were the Egyptians. If you can remember, they came up with the sundial and they had a lot of things. But society on a whole never really held to science so much. And here it is that Job, this simple man, before there was an Egyptian society really, wrote that he draws up the drops of water, which they still as rain to the streams. My God. And when he do that, he pours, the clouds pour out their moisture. And that one of us shows fall on mankind. But guess what? The wise man Solomon also write about it. Ecclesiastes chapter 1 verse 7. All the rivers run into the sea. Yet yeah, the sea is not full. Well, better yet. Yet the sea is not full. So, if all the rivers run into the sea, eventually the sea is supposed to be full. To the point where it's supposed to start to take over the land. But the wise man said, look here, all the rivers run to the sea, yet the sea is not full. Unto the place from whence the rivers came, thither they return again. What a cycle. So it runs into the sea. The sun brings it back up by evaporation. It goes into the cloud. So the Bible taught this hydraulic cycle long before man even realized it. Look at some other verses. Job chapter 26 verse 8. Just to make the point, I think God wants us to get the point that he knows this. He wraps up the waters in his clouds. My God. How would he, he, yet the clouds do not burst under their weight. Powerful God. Because guess what? The water goes up into the cloud in the form of evaporation. And when it is time for it to fall, it comes back down. He draws up the drops of water. Which distilled as rain to the streams. The clouds pour down their moisture and abundant showers fall on mankind. Job chapter 36, verse 27 to 28. Look at some more verses. Do you know the laws of the heavens? Can you set up God's dominion over the earth? Can you raise your voice to the clouds and cover yourselves with a flood of water? Job chapter 38, verse 32 to 34. Who has the wisdom to count the clouds? Who can tip over the water jars of the heavens? The man I talk about everything already, you know. The man is, boy, I tell you, if you should stop to exegete all of this, it'll blow your mind. Job chapter 20, verse 26. When he made a decree for the rain and a part for the thunderstorm, the man had meteorology part. Long before this other guy, um, Bernard Policy, who said that he came up with the idea, lie. I think that God gave him the wisdom in this time because we now have the technology to prove that the things that the Bible was saying a long time exist. What a God. What a God. Let us jump to the last one. 
which is physics. The last one that is physics. Uniformitarians and general evolutionists today claim our world is advancing and developing from simple to complex. Now, I'm going to show you a picture. And I know most of you in some biology book have seen it before. Look at this one. You ever seen that before? This is supposed to show in one form or the other that man evolved from a lesser form to a greater form. So Charles Darwin declared that man was monkey then he became this type of man that type of man till he eventually reached where he is today and we are continuing involving from a simple form to a more complex form you know one of the things about this it contradicts the very science that they teach but the word of god is so true that the word of god will only support the true science and not the false one now there's a law that is called the law of thermodynamics. And you have the first law of thermodynamics which states that um, energy is neither created nor destroyed, but it's come from one form to the other. Right? But there's a second law of thermodynamics, and it's best summarized like this. Everything moves towards disorder or to a condition known as entropy. In other words, things don't move from lesser to more complex. It moves from complex to less. Give a good example. When you boil water, it puts up a lot of energy. But ever try to turn off the pot and leave the water on it for a little while, what happened? The water doesn't go from heat to more heat. Unless there's a catalyst or something pushing it to that form. If leave in its natural state, it moves from heat to coal. That's entropy. You ever put a ball on a hill and just put, leave it there and something act on it? What does it do? Does it roll up the hill or does it run down the hill? It runs down the hill because everything spirals down. I remember when I was 18 and, and, and I know some of the people in here, they say, boy, why are you a young boy? You're just 37. But I really don't feel like I'm 18 anymore. The other day I went to a hotel with my wife. I think it was sometime in last year. And I remember I used to do some things as a young man. I used to flick, walk on my hand, flick off a house top, back, flick off a house top. I even went to back to a school to look at a wall that I used to flick off. And no, I wouldn't even jump off that wall. But me trying to impress the Browning. Hallelujah. Decided that I was going to walk on my hands. And I went on my hands and I, and I, I was still able to do it. My brothers and sisters, because of entropy. And I was not fit. I was not, there was nothing working against that. My brothers and sisters, I saw blinkies. I felt pain. I was like, my God, I thought this was it. I was like, God, I'm going to die. Trying to prove myself. But it just shows you that as we move on, a lot of us as young ladies, and, and, and you have to be careful, that's why the Bible says, uh, favor is deceitful and beauty is vain. But a woman that fears the Lord, she shall be praised. If you hold on to your beauty and think it's going to be forever, a lot of ladies that we see are old women, and you might see them now, and they're not necessarily attractive per se. But you can see them in their 20s, and it's the same woman, you're like, whoa. But we move to a state of, Entropy. Women will tell you what happened to their breasts and what other things point down that used to point up. Hallelujah. And a lot of these things. But, <laughs> but it shows the second law of thermodynamics at work. Guess what happened? The Bible had this thing together a long time ago. Look at Psalm 102 verse 25 to 26. A whole has thou laid the foundation of the earth and the heavens are the works of thy hand. 
So he's talking about God. Then go on to say, they shall perish, but thou shall endure forever. So he was comparing God and the things that we see in this life. All of them shall wax all like a garment, as a vexer shall low change them, and they shall be changed. Only God alone is immutable. Only God alone is the same yesterday and today and forever. Even some persons who have heard preachers who know the stuff, and when they know what it is because they get old, they say, boy, when in my younger days, I would have been spitting fire. And they talk about these things all the time, and we understand. And that's why God ensured that the thing is passed on from generation to generation. We ensure even at Faith Chapel that we pass on the button. We don't hold on to it and tie it up and lay it in our hands. I love Bishop Dale and I love Bishop Grizzle. And these men understood these things. Because at the end of the day, it's entropy going to take all of us. We have our time, we come, we flourish, and we're gone back down. Evolution had it wrong. You tell me one man who born and then today he is more, more superior in terms of his being. He can now fly and he can do this and that than when he was born. No, eventually we move down. We move to a state of going down. The universe-wide degeneration began with God's curse to Adam. When God cursed Adam in Genesis chapter 3 verse 17 to 19. And let me just read that for you quickly so we just don't leave out no scripture. Genesis chapter 3, verse 17 to 19. And it reads like this. And, and unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I command thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Curse is the ground for thy sake. And we can read, go on, him talk about the dust of your, but him talking about the earth being cursed. You have a nice, pretty lawn. You don't keep that lawn together, eventually it goes to a state of tittles take it over, and weed take it over, and all kind of things take it over. You have to constantly be maintaining this thing, maintaining this thing, maintaining this thing, because everything moves to a state of disorder. Now, brothers and sisters, time would fail me to talk about a lot of things. Talk about Noah's flood. To show that geology, talk about the sediments and the deposit of fossils, we provide support for the biblical account of Noah's flood. The time would have failed me to tell you about the mathemat mathematical value of pi. You know, 22 over 7, and how the Bible knew about that long before mathematicians came up with the fact of 22 over 7. Time would have failed me to tell you that is now they realize that man come, was made from the same element of the earth. Only the Bible tells that in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. And that ear having weight. Because a lot of people don't even realize that ear carry weight. Tell me that fear if I tell you, if we go outside of science and start going to stuff like, uh, what do you call it? Prophecy. Bring it full circle and come back around to Bible and talk about prophecy and tell you where the Bible tell you this from that time how it was fulfilled and come to pass during this time. But all of these things, I think I have made the point that you can believe the word of God. You can believe the word of God. We see from the science that the word of God was true all along. And even though men doubted that time because many people didn't even believe that the earth was grown. Many people even realized that blood cried, the life of the flesh was in the blood. A lot of people never understood these things. We serve a God that is intelligently planned and excluding everything. He's not clumsy. He has placed in his word as a witness to you and I that we can believe the word of God. As accurate as he was about science, he's equally accurate about the man who rejects God and what will happen to him. I want to close with this particular thing. The Bible actually states in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38 that Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you. In the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And he shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Can I talk to you for like two minutes? 
I don't know who is watching this Bible study tonight. I don't know if you are unsaved and you don't have the Holy Ghost. I don't know if you are a person who just happened to come across this particular video. But as accurate as God was in science, in physics, in, in astronomy, in biology, and as I said before, there are many areas that we miss out, mathematics, so on and so on, as accurate as we see the word of God is, is equally as accurate as what will happen to you if you reject God. Holy Ghost. The Bible says, if you don't believe the word of God, you are condemned already. Because you have not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. The Bible says, repent. And if you don't repent, you shall likewise perish. The word of God says, you must live according to what he has prescribed. Don't let nobody fool you and tell you that this book is a book of fables. Don't let nobody come to you and tell you that all of these men that have come across the scene, all of the men that we spoke about in the earlier part of the Bible study, they died in their folly. And guess what happened? The word of God is still here today. Hallelujah. Still alive and well. The Bible says when Peter preached on the day of Pentecost, when the church started, they were pricked in their hearts. They realized that there was something more to this thing. You see? The word of God is not just mere words, you know. The Bible said they are spirit and they are life. But what I like about the fact is that God loves you so much. It's like, it's, it's much more romantic when you handwrite something, you know. Nowadays, people used to text, you know, and send in text messages. But back in the day, when a man like a woman and love a woman, he spend the time in his own handwriting and he would write it. And it came across as a romantic gesture to say that this person loves you. God loves you so much that he's never going to leave it up to chance. The Bible already said that the heavens declare the glory of God in them. God could have leave that fact to say, okay, we can find God by just looking into the heavens. But God loves you so much. That he wrote a book. He put his message for you in a book. So that at the end of the day, the Bible says, you are inexcusable. Oh man. The Bible says, how can you escape if you neglect so great a salvation? And when Peter preached to them on the day of Pentecost, I hope that somebody's heart is pricked in the Holy Ghost tonight. They said, men and brethren, what shall we do? Tonight I'm going to leave that word with you. You can believe the word of God. You can believe the word of God. Peter says we must repent. And we baptize every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. For the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. There is a statement in the same Acts chapter 2. That I want to read. Hallelujah. It says. And with many other words did he testify. And exhort saying, that's verse 40, save yourselves from this untoward generation. Men and brethren, you can believe the word of God. If the word of God says repent, repent. If the word of God says baptize in Jesus' name, baptize in Jesus' name. If the word of God says must get the Holy Ghost, ask God to fill it with the Holy Ghost. Because that's the only way, according to the word of God, that you're going to be able to save yourself from this untoward generation. Brethren, as Bishop Dale is going to move on in the session, walk in the word. We can walk in the word, but not only that, we walk in the word because we believe in the word. He that cometh to God, the Bible says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. And as I said before, God does leave it clumsily, but God gives us the evidence that we can trust every word of God. Every word. Amen. From the beginning to the end. From Genesis to Revelation. We can hold the word of God in our hearts. You can believe the word of God. Believe the word of God. And come to know him if you don't know him. Whom to know is life eternal. And for those of us who are going through situations in our lives. And we're having some hard time and there's a struggle and there's a fight. 
And there's a, there is like the enemy seem like he's going to win. Mm -mm. The word of God already declared in Revelation that there's a place reserved for the devil. He's going to be cast into the pit of fire. That bottomless pit. He's going to be cast into eternal damnation. He must try to get you for doubt. Don't make the mistake of Eve. He wants you to doubt the word of God. And if he can't get you to doubt the word of God, he wants you to, to, to distort the word of God. Which is you're going to say some of it is true and some of it is not true. But don't make the mistake of Eve. You can believe the entire word of God today. God bless you. In Jesus' name. We're going to pray. We're going to pray. Holy Ghost. And we're going to ask God to help us to put the word of God in our hearts. Faith comes by hearing. And by hearing the word of God. Let us pray. Holy God, we have come to you this evening to magnify your name. There's none like you. There's none to be compared to you. From the rising of the sun to the going down of the same. We thank you, God, that you have given us the word of God. You have given us the written word. You have given us the living word because you yourself came on the scene and you ministered to us. You have given to us the written word. You have given to us the Holy Ghost. And God, you have given to us so many witnesses to prove that you exist, to prove that your word is true. If right now, God, I come against that spirit of doubt, I come against Holy Ghost, that spirit of unbelief. Hallelujah. And we ask God that you will inject in their spirit. Amen. A spirit of faith. For without faith, the Bible said, it is impossible to please God. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. For the Bible says, for it, by it the elders have obtained a good report. Tonight, we hold on to the word of God with our entire lives. If it's going to cost us our lives, we hold on to the word of God. Because if we die in Christ, we have not died. To be absent from the body is just to be present with the Lord. God, we hold on to the word of God. We're not going to leave out this word. And God, we're going to continue, Lord Jesus, to even pay attention to the words that our bishop is teaching us at this time. As we walk in the word. Help us, Lord Jesus, to hide our words. This is where we tell shall a young man cleanse his ways. But by taking heed to the word of God. Holy Ghost, we thank you today for this Bible study. We thank you for everybody that will hear this Bible study. We thank you, Lord, for every ears, every unsaved person that will be on this session. Every doubter, every skeptic mind. Hallelujah. Every agnostic, God, every atheist that will come to this Bible study. But at the end of the day, we pray, God, that you said your word is spirit and your word is life. You said your word is like a two-edged sword. I pray, God, that somebody's heart will be pierced. Somebody will be convinced. Somebody will be convicted. Somebody will be moved to move from faith to faith. Somebody will realize that God is still in their corner. Some saved person will realize who is going through situations and troubles right now will come to an acknowledgement that God is still in control and there's nothing that takes him by surprise. Thank you, God, for your word. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for this session. Bless the hearers of this word tonight. Continue, Lord Jesus, to bless Bishop Daly. Continue, Lord Jesus, to bless the ministers of faith apostolic ministry. Continue, Lord Jesus, to bless Jesus, hallelujah, every saint, every choir member, every musician, the media team, Continue, Lord Jesus, to bless them as we bring the word, this entire gospel to the entire world. Thank you, Holy Ghost, as we look to you, the great God of heaven. In Jesus' name I pray right now, in Jesus' name. God bless you. God bless you. In Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus' name.